Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, for the first Sunday of Advent 2019. After Thanksgiving, I was sitting around with some friends, all of us parents of millennials, and we were talking about the pessimistic generation. Um, most of them seem to find their pessimism warranted by virtue of the way the world is, as they put it. Uh, then someone asked me for my opinion, and I told them I dissented. This current generation is the most free of war and disease, at least in the developed world, that probably any generation has had. Um, they have unprecedented levels of information and ability to travel. I see millennials traveling all over the world in ways that, that I certainly didn't think of when I was their age. And yet they're deeply pessimistic about the future to the point of suicide and not even reproducing, saying, how could anyone bring a child into this world? And I thought, have you ever read any history? Uh, the world seems to be about as good today as it's ever been, yet why so pessimistic? I think a lot of this has to do with the ongoing pervasiveness and increase in a secular worldview. A secular worldview basically says that public knowledge is based on scientific knowledge. It's empirical. It's reproducible. So they live in the iron box of secularism where you can't see the stars to navigate by them. But human knowledge works very different from scientific knowledge. We live embedded in stories, and, and we feel the anxiety from the secular worldview seeping in. Um, those who push science at the exclusion of religion don't seem to know people. People are thoroughly religious, and they'll pick up astrology or any new religious movement that comes their way. Now, we look for human solutions. Well, human beings, we should all know what human beings are since we are those. My dog doesn't listen to my videos. Um, what is a human being? You spend your first years of life managing to learn about your hands and your feet and trying to manage your emotions, and you quickly realize that the world is a mixed bag full of, full of ice cream and pain. And, and so we have collectives, we tribe up to improve our power and to improve our stability and to improve getting what we want from this world. And, and then tribes create coalitions and keep look, looking for forwards for points of agreement or, or, or unity over goals or identity over conveniences. And maybe our coalition of tribes can, can give us more power and give us more security and give us more of what we're looking for to remove our anxiety. But the competitions don't end. Just today I saw how Camilla Harris's campaign is unraveling this piece in the New York Times. She noted that her sister, someone very much from her tribe, someone from her biological family, is her chairwoman, someone she trusts. But many others look at that and say, well, if you've got your sister as a chair, as a chairperson, well, of your campaign, well, and it's not going so well, nobody's going to talk against your sister because she's family. And so people compete with, within nations to, to get to the top of the hierarchy, whether that's a presidential campaign or a business model, and then nations compete with other nations. And, and what we begin to realize is that most of our challenges are not really technical. Now that we have all of this technical ability, most of our challenges are political. Our challenges are other people. A number of times I've mentioned climate change, which for millennials seems to be a, a big, their biggest element of concern. And the challenges of climate change don't seem to be, at least man-made climate change, don't seem to be technical at all. We know what creates CO2, but we have no confidence that the world with its, with, with its hodgepodge political factions, even within the United States, why... <laughs> So you've got AOC claiming the world is going to end in 12 years. It'll be re, it'll be, we'll pass beyond the point of no return. And so millennials say, why should I reproduce in such a world? And, and yet these, these seemingly well-known videos and by knowledgeable scientific people say why some people don't believe in climate change. Four out of, four out of 10 Americans don't believe in climate change. Well, what do you think the numbers are for the rest of the world? If, if the most educated, the most propagandized people in the world won't buy what it seems the, the dominant powers of our culture are, are desperately trying to impose in them every time there's a storm or every time there's a drought or every time there's any significant weather event that's newsworthy, climate change gets thrown into the mix. Yet, yeah, it doesn't work. And so, of course, 
there's no confidence in a political solution. To make matters worse, our life scales. We think about these things on the big, on the big picture, but whether or not these things are touching our little lives, most of us are more anxious about the things that are in our immediate family. The whole world, you know, we frame with our imaginations, but we feel up close the familial relationships and the problems that come. Life, which is not necessarily so much our biological lives as the stories we tell ourselves, life has always been anxious, insecure, and short. And in fact, if you go over to Slate Star Codex and you look at how many people have problems, well, everybody has problems. People are in prison, on probation, in nursing homes, have dementia, have chronic pain, are depressed, have schizophrenia, are on food stamps, are poor, are alcoholic. And, and this scales in terms of rich and poor. People are a mess. And that's the way the world is. And it seems has always been. Now, the Bible is the story of the world, and the Bible begins with, with human community. And when the, the first man meets the first woman, there's this song of joy, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But just one chapter later, he's, he's throwing her and God under the bus. It quickly devolves into fault finding. It was the woman that you gave me. And then we divide the people of the world into good people and bad people. And even in the most um, imaginably favorable cut, the world's best man and his family, Noah, get saved by a flood and all the rest are drowned. And not long after the ark, the world's best man gets drunk and curses his mocking son. And so what we find with people, no matter how educated or secular, is that, well, they look to stories and they look to the stars and because our stories are, our lives are stories. They're the, the story that we know ourselves to be that doesn't age. And so we're embedded in stories. And so we're constantly looking around, looking for guidance from stories. And religion begins as transactional exchange with the gods. Worldly success proves favor with the gods. The gods can be bought, perhaps, with sacrifices and with the blood of animals and with temples and with, with priests selling the transactions all along the way. And then Israel's God comes along and tells a different story. In the book of Isaiah, the first chapter goes on. When you come to appear before me, God says, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Religious services are usually an appearance before the court of the gods. We imagine it as a, as a political exchange. And, and here, the God of Israel, whereas the oracles of, of the Egyptians and the Babylonians, the priests were constantly admonishing the people to bring more sacrifices here in, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah who seemed to have been connected with the temple, God says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbath, and convocations. I can't bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They've become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Do you feel that way sometimes? Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Very fashionable word right now. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widows. It doesn't say... Keep verbally admonishing people to do this. It says, actually do it. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, that's the assumption, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Well, how? If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But, I will res but if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This seems sort of like transactional religion. Do good things and God will bless. Do bad things and God will curse. And, and, and the conversation certainly begins like that. 
But then you read the whole story of Israel and it's one long, sad story of pain and failure. God gives them the opportunity to do exactly what we want. Give me a chance to achieve and, and I will be good. And we don't. Again and again, we just find fault with one another. Well, because fault is easy to find. To be chosen, it seems, by God for Israel seems to be chosen to suffer. What then would be the meaning of Messiah or Christ or an anointed one? Israel was chosen. Israel was anointed. She couldn't pull it off. After Isaiah 1 comes Isaiah 2. In the last days, the Lord's temple will be established. Was it destroyed? As the highest of the mountains. It's about two, 3,000 feet. What, what does he mean by the highest of the mountains? Well, he's speaking symbolically. This will be the, the central mountain. This will be the central place of all the earth. The mountains were the place that was nearest to the heavens, everyone assumed. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we might walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. But wasn't that tried? Didn't, didn't Israel try this? And Israel herself couldn't seem, to, couldn't seem to pull this off. And then this verse, which still haunts us. He will judge between the nations. Because right now all the nations do is fight. And when one wins, we declare that that was God's judgment. But he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. What does that mean? That means that costly weapons will be used for, for farm implements, farming, gardening, just where the story started. Nations will not take up sword against nations, nor will they train for war anymore. We long for half of this. We're, we're leery about, tr about, about, about trusting a God who judges. But we'd certainly love to have disputes settled by peoples. Wasn't that why the League of Nations and then the United Nations was started? Has the United Nations been able to keep us from war? How? How will this be? We trust only ourselves, but we see how small we are and, and how sure we are to perish. Upon what can this hope be founded? True Israel, the chosen one, was chosen to suffer. This one was accused, but offered no defense of himself. He was forsaken by God in the eyes of the world, not because of his failures, but because of the failures of his enemies. And now, like a child, we look up with different eyes and we say, could God send such a one? Could one come? The world is still big and we are small, but his salvation indeed scales. It scales up to the size of world danger if he is in fact the God of heaven and earth and scales down to the personal, because the Chosen One of God has come. Now Advent is a funny time. Advent is about first and second comings. Advent is about intervention. When we throw up our hands in this world and realize we have no hope, we can't solve the problems of this world. And so God comes and does the unimaginable, becomes our victim, and says, point the finger at me. Make me your scapegoat. And see what I do. See what I do. Can we trust in one another? We confess his death and resurrection until he comes. It's the beginning of Advent. It's the beginning of the Christian year. Where we pause and remember the stories. Understand what story we are embedded in understand the nature of our hope and from where our hope comes. Our hope comes from the Lord who gave his life as a ransom for many.